It's the Score North Twin Show. And welcome in to my home studio, Phil Mackey, and Target Field, where Judd Zolgad is in a broom closet somewhere in the press box. Declan here, Goff, who go. will join us, is down. Oh, look at those lockers. Yeah, lockers. those lockers have been there since the origin. Of, I used to do podcasts with Derek Wetmore in there like I know. seven years ago. Yeah, I know. I'm getting emotional. Very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting emotional. It's old home week. Man, so well, so let's set the scene here. This is so if you're new to the Score North Twin Show, we've got our regular full cast Score North Twin Shows multiple days a week. We got Trevor Plouffe Tuesdays on Tuesdays. Uh, ordinarily and going forward, Declan Goff is the host of these extra innings episodes. He's down in the clubhouse right now with Rocco and uh, some of the Twins players. So he'll join us. We got a random twin of the week here. You're at the ballpark. Kind of a buzzkill for Twins fans waiting all these weeks and months for. For uh, spring baseball at Target Field, it was a beautiful day, like 50-some degrees and sunny, but uh, the Twins couldn't really get the bats going. They wound up going 0 for two and a half hours with runners in scoring position today, 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position. Uh, just like one or two hits, and they would have won this game 5-4, to four, Judd. But, yeah, welcome in, folks. Appreciate you guys finding the Scorner Twin Show YouTube channel as well. If you could click the like button and the subscribe button, you can help us grow this thing, but... What are your main takeaways here from the Twins home opener here? Three and three on the season now. Um, the bats are inconsistent at best. Like they, they did come alive five runs seventh yesterday in Milwaukee. Uh, they came alive Saturday late in that game, but they've been very, very spotty hit and miss. And I, I mean, as I look at the old scorecard here, it's pretty simple to see the demise of today's game. In the second, you get a single from Correa, who had three hits, was great today uh then santana flies out to right then walner is hit by a pitch then a strikeout but then vasquez reaches on an error so you've got the bases loaded in the bottom of the second julian strikes out looking now julian did have a wind aided home run today but he also struck out looking three times i thought it was an interesting side note that Baldelli actually let him bat against the southpaw in the seventh which also was his final strikeout looking but um you know pablo lopez began to scuffle in the middle innings of this game phil but i would say my biggest takeaway is you 100 percent need more consistency from the bats and just look at uh between buxton and kepler today in the three and the four holes you've got an 0 for eight there with uh five strikeouts that's the problem yeah 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 it's uh, it's it, it's so tough too because it's early on here you're a week into the season you know, the, do I think the Guardians are the best team in the division? No. Are they hitting like it right now and playing like it? Yes. So I've always said, like, give me three or four weeks to just figure out what is what here. But yeah, like at some point, you got to start just hitting a dribbler out the middle at the very least. Or if there's a guy on third base, right? If Alex Kirloff hits a triple with one out, you know, you got Buxton and Kepler coming up. Someone's got to make contact and just manufacture a run in that spot. So. Yeah, I would say like on Correa for a second, because I am not I am not in a doom and gloom mode here with this team. A three and three start. Okay, you've avoided a disaster start, anyways. But I think the the biggest headline to start the season, aside from the Royce Lewis injury, is Carlos Correa looks totally different than he did last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying that because you know the box scores look good. He just he looks so comfortable at the plate. Uh, you know, just. From a balance standpoint, he's waiting back on off-speed pitches, and he he drove that one breaking ball into the corner in left field. Uh, he did bobble a ball at shortstop today that led to a run, and then almost bobbled the run down <laughs> that led to another run on the same play. Uh, but overall, he just to me he looks like that's the silver lining today is that the old Carlos Correa is back after that foot injury last year. Absolutely, yeah, he he looked great. Um, I would say that so because, yeah, we're what, four games in, five games in. So I get your point completely. I mean, it's baseball. It's 162 games. And it's not like you're 0-5. Uh, I would say the PTSD, though, of today's game, it's the runners in scoring position to a certain degree, but it's also the 15 strikeouts, right? Because to go back to your point, put the bat on the ball. Like, okay, if you make outs that way, 
But when Julian strikes out three times, Buxton strikes out three times, Kepler, who looks terrible right now, strikes out twice. Santana strikes yeah. out twice. Castro strikes out twice. So, like, I, I don't I don't fault fans who are like, hold on a second. Is this a replay of a lot, lot of the same things that were problematic a year ago? So that that's the one thing. It's like, just give yourself a chance. Because as we've talked about on our shows for how long, you know, you could downplay strikeouts all you want, but if you put the ball in play, you give yourself a chance for something to happen. If you don't put the ball in play, you're basically screwed. So that's the one thing where if fans are a little bit like, what's going on here? I totally get that. 15 strikeouts. It felt like Joey Gallo belonged in the game today. Yeah, it did. It definitely triggered a little PTSD from last year's team that I believe set the all-time major league record for strikeouts in a season. Now, the the good news on that front is you did get rid of one of the all-time highest strikeout rates, Joey Gallo. Michael A. Taylor is one of the biggest strikeout hitters in baseball. You've cleared hundreds of those plate appearances out of your lineup in favor of Carlos Santana, who I know struck out twice in four plate appearances today, but he is not a high strikeout hitter. Now yep. he's getting older, so maybe the strikeouts go up as he gets older. And another guy that's not a very big strikeout hitter is Alex Kirloff in his career in the minors and the majors. I mean, he's, you know, the the, the Joey Gallows of the world strike out 38, 40% of their plate appearances. Mm-hmm. Kirloff's more like 24, 25%. So I, I do think long term here throughout the course of the season, getting Kirloff plate appearances mixed in. Santana, you're not going to see as many of these 14 or 15 strikeout games. But yes, it is very triggering today. First home game back that, of course, they strike out 15 times. Okay, how much of a cop out is it that it's a three o'clock in the afternoon game and the shadows were creeping in for most of it? Now, the Guardians only struck out seven times and they dealt with the same shadows, right? It goes both ways. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, I I would say that's because of that fact. It's a pretty big cop out. Now, I do have some questions, though. Like Cleveland is now six and two. And to go back to what you said at the top of the show, like how good are the guardians? Because like you look at the lineup and it certainly does not instill fear, right? Um, They got good pitching or they got effective pitching today. But, you know, I guess I just have questions there. And God knows, as we discussed, I think it was on the show last week, their payroll, their payroll makes the twins look like the Yankees. I know it's and yeah, it is. But but this is like kind of classic Guardians where uh, true. You, you you go into the season, you're like, ah, you look at the roster, and you're like, I don't know, it's just kind of a bunch of random dudes and you know, their their pitching is turning over again, but like always, they just they just find dudes like Tanner Bybee who come in and throw frisbees for five or six innings. You know, he's a guy that made 25 starts, had an ERA under three last year, and he looked unhittable for stretches today. Control's a little wonky with that guy so far this season. But sure. uh, but I would say that, like, in terms of the walks that he issued, there was a couple. I think it was there was a plate appearance, was it by Julian early in the game? And I guess he didn't. I guess Bybee didn't have any walks. But, like, he, he worked a bunch of, like, you know, he got to 91 pitches in, like, four innings or whatever. Um, but he worked some three ball counts and there was one in particular, I think it was Julian and Morno pointed this out on the broadcast where Bybee throws a change up fading away to a left-handed hitter on the outside. Uh, Julian lays off of it and then he comes right back. Actually, I'm sorry. He swung and missed at the change up and then he comes right back with like a little cutter on the inside half that mm-hmm. Julian spit on it. So some of these Twins hitters are really good. Like Kirloff is the same way, Correa, at laying off tough pitches. But I just want to give credit to the Indians or the Guardians once again for just pulling another really good pitcher out of there, you know what, <laughs> to throw at the Twins in these division games. It's a remarkable thing. Now, the one now I, I do want to talk about one guy um, that I don't know how much patience I, I would have with, given his spring as well at the plate, and that is Matt Walner. I, I, you know, that just strikes me as a guy that might need to go down and get right. And like, there are some guys at St. Paul who are, who are hitting. I'll tell you who intrigues me, Jose Miranda. I feel like we gave up on him. Like he was hurt. He was legitimately hurt. And I feel like, and I feel like we, like, we've just been like, well, yeah, he's not going to come up 
Um, he's back playing some third base. I just don't know. In Walner's case, I don't know if he's not going to need a trip down just to get right because, like, there's been no period of time yet aside from a very uh, brief stint in spring training where he's hit, and it looks like in watching him now, it looks like the confidence is sort of shot. He needs to get yeah. it back. I think they're going to give him a couple weeks, but yeah, you're right. If they've got other options that are just ready to rock and roll, if he lit it up in spring training, I think you'd feel a little bit better. Ordinarily, spring training performance doesn't matter a whole lot. 100% agree. But in a case like this where he doesn't have a very long major league track record, it's possible that opposing team scouting reports have caught up to him a little bit. I still think he's going to be a productive. I don't think he was like a one and done flash in the pan. I think he's going to have a productive career. But yeah. You're probably right. He probably has to go down at some point. Um, just from a vibe standpoint, you know, nice day at the ballpark. Crowd looked like it was buzzing on TV. But at the same time, people were kind of mad about the offseason payroll cutting. In general, did we pick up where we left off inside that ballpark from the playoffs? Was it like what was the vibe like inside Target Field today? So they, they announced 35,595, and there were a ton of seats empty, but there were a ton of, obviously, on a cold day, people standing. So, like, I do, I don't doubt that there was a really good crowd here. It looked like it. I would say this the vibe of those Toronto games was phenomenal. Like, it was off the charts because it's a playoff game, right? Like, this was not a great game. Um, but did I sense like anger, angst from the crowd? No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, it, it's funny, you know. Things like Twitter and X are such an interesting place to go to because the vile there can be so strong that I think sometimes it leads you to believe, oh, my God, people are really, really pissed off. And then you like go, go to the game and it's opening day and fans are having fun. So I would say for opening day, you know, that it was or I should say home opener for the twins, that the vibe was definitely not like one of angst at all. The vibe was good. Yeah. But, you know, to go back to, to the playoffs, that vibe was absolutely incredible because of what that win, especially the first win against Toronto, just meant to the whole franchise. Yeah, to your point, too, about living in this bubble, especially us, where we're mostly talking to, like, the hardcore fans who are following all the, the day-to-day stories. I don't know that that is the average fan that goes to Target Field. You know, there's a lot of diehards. But I kind of learned this with the Glenn Taylor, A-Rod, Mark Lurie stuff from last week on the Timberwolves side where – people who follow the team passionately who consume the Dane Moore NBA podcast or flagrant howls or are just entrenched in it every day had really strong opinions on the ownership situation. But then you get inside the actual arena and no one is chirping Glenn Taylor. No one's booing him. Or there was like one random guy at the bulls game that was like, sell the team. The yeah. old fart. And that was, it. and, and, and it's not like, and unlike Target Center, where Glenn is sitting front and center next to the Wolves bench, you don't see Joe Polad or any other Polads walking around. So there's really no one to boo or or to chirp. But I was just kind of wondering if if the quiet off season maybe poured some cold water on the fans' enthusiasm. But but it came it came across through the TV like people were pretty excited. I think if the team struggles, like like if things go south here for a uh, you know a week to two weeks, then the mood here changes. Yeah. But you know, they came home when they won, won two or three in KC. They split against the Brewers. Now they lost today, but they had chances as well. So I think the I think the start eventually at some point this this month will dictate the mood. And plus, you know what? If they don't play well, they just won't draw because it's April and it's not that night. I mean it's nice, but it's not that nice. And and they are uh shutting down the upper decks in the grandstand, uh, I think starting with the Dodgers on Monday. So those upper decks, but what they're going to do is they're going to take anyone who has season ticket packages in the upper deck and complimentary move them down, which is actually pretty smart. Yeah. I like that. What, Hey, what, what percentage of the 40,000 seats in that stadium or like the 38, 39,000 seats are lower deck seats. Do we know? I don't know off the top of my head because the outfield upper deck skews it because it because and that, that's not going to close down and that's fairly yeah. large. But I, you know, I think it's a, a decent amount. And as you know, too, you know, if you go down the third and first base lines here in the lower deck, you know, this time of year, starting with 
Saturday's game. There's always lots of room there. Um, but yeah, I think the team, I think for two weeks in and things aren't going well, the vibe changes. And plus w- when the crowds are smaller, it's far more easier to hear a boisterous, you know, guy named Earl who's pissed off about the payroll. Like today was opening day. The, so the place is pretty packed and people are drinking and having fun. Um, yeah. if, if it doesn't go well, then I think we start to hear that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the vibe this afternoon was positive and here's the thing phil as we talked about they had chances today like like this was not the cleveland didn't shut them down where they were no. getting on base they had chances and and when you look at the totality this lineup produce it really should i'm i'm surprised that they haven't been more consistent and i know it's a very small um amount of games i am surprised they haven't been more consistent yet and i fully expect that 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 will come they might have to shuffle things but i Buxton looked bad. Do I think Buxton's going to continue to look bad at, at the plate now that he's healthy? I don't think so. And he's looked good at different times this season. Yeah, I would say if you're getting 12 plate appearances with runners in scoring position, you would take that every single night and roll the dice and see what happens. So process-wise, I'm good with it. One other thing, I'm going to be positive Phil here for this entire episode. I know they lost, but... Can we talk about Alex Kirloff a little bit more here too? One for Absolutely. four. He had the triple to start things. Yep. So people, and we've we've had some battles, and, and Declan's coming up the steps right now, and he's setting up. So he'll join us with a report from the clubhouse on this Scorn Our Twin Show Extra Innings Edition. But people sort of forgot about him or wrote him off and just dismissed, ah, he made, he made that error against the Astros, and he hasn't been reliable with the injuries, and... And it's like, man, a couple years ago, he was regarded as one of the top young players in the entire game. One of the top young hitters across all of Major League Baseball in terms of prospects. And so far this year, he has burst out of the gate. 24 plate appearances. He's got the two triples, two doubles. He's batting over 400. I know, super small sample size. But in terms of process, he has two strikeouts in 24 plate appearances, which means he's dialed in. He's barreling things up. He's making good contact. And it's just a guy that we've kind of said, ah, we'll just put him over here in a different bin. But he has the potential to be one of your best hitters if things are clicking and he's healthy. So mm-hmm. be on the lookout, man. Like, that's a really positive sign that Alex Kirloff has joined this party. In terms of eye test, though, as well on Kirloff, he looks really good. I mean, that swing. See that that's the thing is that swing is a sweet swing. Now, now we can debate yes. the health is a problem. There's concerns there consistently. I understand all that. Uh, he he got hit by a pitch today in the ribs, and I thought, oh my god. But anyway, um, this guy profiles really well too as a DH because that swing is really good. And so, yeah, I I think that. I think guys like Kirloff and Miranda, who I don't know yet, but my point is let's see him healthy and let's give him a chance. Cause we do tend to baseball's weird. We tend to sort of just write guys off while he failed or he got hurt. Okay. But there was something there previously. It's not like they, they were terrible and you know, Judd and Phil are saying, give them another shot. So yeah, I think Kirloff, when you see that swing, he really barrels the ball up. Well, there's a lot to like there. There is a lot to like. I agree with you. Yes. All right, Joe. We're going to go down the hall about 100 feet from you and bring in our guy, the Dexter, Declan Goff from the clubhouse. I think Declan's in the Legends Club. Judd's in a broom closet right now. So, In a broom closet and on this phone, huh? We got a, we got a little bit of a microphone issue like the runners in scoring uh, my... position today. Are we batting 0 for 12? Yeah, Judd's 0 for, 0 for 12 using his microphone right now on the Scorner Twin new... Show. I got a new cord. I thought it was the cord. It turns out it's the mic. I'm just lost. Well, I mean, it, it's opening day for everyone. My fiance is going to kill me. I had pen all over my uh, white shirt here. Oh, so sure no. That's, what that's, happened, that's, dude? I Just like an idiot, you know, I'm, I'm flailing my pen around a little bit. And then at about the third inning, I look down and I'm like, oh. You Did the pen, like, crack me. and leak ink? Or were you no, just drawing idiot, on your sleeve? My idiot self was just, you know, 
banging the pen back and forth here and there, and then I realize that I have ink all over my shirt. My, my, she's gonna kill me. I already sent her a text, and you're gonna be so mad at me. Look what I did. I'm just a, basically a functioning toddler trying to cover a baseball game. That's all it is. That's wow. all I'm trying to wow. do. It's opening today. day jitters for everybody. It you really know? is. You know what, Declan? I sat by you the entire game. You are serving the job. Like, no. I mean, you know what? She shouldn't be mad. You're you're going out of your way to bring twins coverage. I love how Judd is arguing know. arguing with your fiance through yeah, you and the twin show right now. It's not his fault. <laughs> It's not his fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. So, okay, what did you, you just came up the steps up the elevator from uh, Twins Clubhouse. What did you learn here, Dex? Uh, so, yeah, Rocco, I talked to Rocco and Pablo. Um, Rocco, you know, again, really liked the at-bats to a degree because they were stringing together a lot of opportunities, 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position today, but then just could not get a big hit. And that's obviously was a, was a huge story of this of this game today. And the Guardians being kind of, a little bit of the op, not the opposite effect, where they don't strike out. I mean, they were incredible. They'll make you work. And Pablo Lopez talked about that as well. That I'm not going to be able to, you know, strike out 10, 11 of these guys. He just has two punch outs here today, and that's how the Guardians operate, man. We were Judd and I were sitting next to each other, obviously during the Ramirez at bat there in the fourth, and I was tracking it on Baseball Savant. Judd was trying to looking at MLB.com, and those were nothing but sweeper, sweeper, sweeper. He refused to throw Jose yeah. Ramirez basically a fastball. And he still gives up a little easy. It's not like he tattooed one on Pablo. He's just one of the better hitters in the game. And the Twins actually, I thought defensively, Doogie brought this up to Rocco, that they made three plays at home plate today that resulted in outs. The Twins defense did. And yet it only results in a couple runs on the offensive side. And the Twins obviously had plenty of chances. But, yeah, just Guardians are going to make you work, dude. I think everyone always writes them off, right, because they're just the Guardians. They're always never going to have a good payroll, and they're this pitching factory. But what is their offense? Their offense is going to make you work. That's what they always do. Yeah. By the way, Stephen Kwan, too, is just – he's like the least assuming professional athlete you've ever seen. Like, if you – he could literally walk through any public place, even in Cleveland probably, and nobody would know – that this guy is one of the toughest outs at times. He's as Justin Morneau described him on the Bally's broadcast. He's just a little gnat. He just he's just yeah. you're you know you're trying to shoo him away, but he just finds ways to foul off pitches and get on base. And so he finds his way on three different times. He's he's a really good table setter. And yeah, like having Ramirez in your lineup can have a bunch of random dudes. We have a hitter like Ramirez with with pedigree, and um, and he knows what he's doing. So yeah, the Guardians. People get real squirrely trying to write them off every year, and uh, and they're just not they're not an easy out. What did yeah? What else did uh, Rocco and Pablo say? Anything else of note down there? Uh, just that Pablo talked a lot about how he knows because he faced them obviously a lot last year that he's going to have to really try to change his execution on how do I get guys out because I mean they're going to foul pitches off, they're going to tip a lot, they're going to do everything they can to keep bats alive, and this is not just you know one two three where the Twins offense is striking out fifteen times today. And, you know, looking more like the offense it was last year to a degree where Cleveland, you might not have heard of half of these guys. And at the same time, they're going to make you work full count. They're going to fall off two or three pitches per at bat. And in general, you know, I, I didn't love at first the first guys out of the bullpen being Funderburk and kind of thought, well, this game's still in reach. And, you know, with all due respect yeah. to Cody Funderburk and Nicole Sands of the world, it was just this game's still in reach. Why are we maybe not, I wouldn't say punting but we're not going to burn one of our big guys because if the offense gets a big hit here, this game's going to completely flip and you can bring in Griffin Jacks or a Brock Stewart, et cetera. And, you know, the Twins just could not buy a run today. And the clutch hitting has been their biggest Achilles heel. They're stringed together good at bats, but at the end of the day, you got to drive in runs. And for whatever reason, this team can't do it. And I will say this too, like today was a great example. And I, and I don't think the 15 strikeouts thing is going to, is going to be a theme like it was last year. I know it was today, but Today was a great example of two teams that basically got on base the same time. I think Cleveland got on base two more times than the Twins. They both had seven hits. Cle they both got hit by two pitches. And then Cleveland had the three walks to the Twins' one walk drawn. So, like, they got on base pretty similar amount of times. But Cleveland's able to just put the ball in play. Okay, runner on third. Hit a fly ball to the warning track. Scores a run. Like, you swap out eight extra outs that are strikeouts if you're the Twins lineup and eight extra balls in play if you're Cleveland and that's getting a runner over. It's hitting yeah. a fly ball to the warning track. It, it, an out isn't just an out. An out can be a productive out. And when you strike out 15 times versus seven, that's eight extra chances for a hit or a productive out. And it just illustrated the difference in 
kind of where the Twins have been to where they should probably go with uh, with the strikeout problem. Yeah, and even like Edward Julian today, he has starts with his first two at bats with back to back looking strikeouts, and I wasn't able to ask Edward about it. He didn't come out of the clubhouse, but um, but he walked away from that body language wise like that guy obviously knows the strike zone really well right like he has probably one of the better eyes in the entire team even though he's so young when he walks away from both those strikeout looking without any defense of ah oh, man i missed both those i missed both those and i know he ends up parking one just in the mauer pots uh here today for his first home run of the season you know you'd like to think if that guy is close that eventually the swings are going to be there a little bit more i know fans were upset and i saw twitter fans being like why isn't Juling swinging the bat he's supposed to be one of their better hitters and he's their leadoff guy that guy knows exactly what his strike zone looks like. So body language wise, when I see someone completely just walk away, getting called out on strike three, he knows what he missed there. So I think there are like encouraging signs with this offense, even with the lack of productivity on clutch hitting. But at the same time, man, you, you can't go 0 for 12 and like they did the other day in the first game against Milwaukee, just failing to drive in runs in clutch situations. Yeah. Hey Dex, did, did Baldelli uh, talk about the decision in the, the seventh there to allow Julian to hit against the southpaw? Yes, we talked he did. about that. It's, he did. Like that's a that's a sign of actual potential progress there, because I feel like at least a year ago, Julian never. It, you know, th that's a farmer at bat. Julian doesn't get that at bat. Yeah, he he brought up the fact that the relief pitcher that was in at the time was just wild. He was all over the place. He wasn't finding the strike zone. So why not give Edward Julian an at bat there? He hit the home run beforehand. He worked two big counts that even led to the strikeouts in his first two at-bats. They decided, Rocco basically made the gut call there of, yes, this is a situation where I would typically pinch hit for the right-hander, but this pitcher's all over the place a little bit. He's being a little erratic. This is still, even though it's lefty on lefty, one of our better hitters and one of our better eyes at the plate. Let's give him a shot here. And, and obviously it didn't work for the Twins, but actually I did applaud Rocco giving a shot for Edward Julian to try to get a big knock. One thing Julian does that kind of drives me nuts sometimes and it's he's not even wrong but you're still uh, until we get to 2025 or 26 and we go electronic strike zone at least for reviews if not just straight across the board you're still dealing with human beings that are trying to eyeball whether it was a strike or not despite yeah. the fact that you guys can sit in the press box with baseball savant or the k-zone open like everyone in america watching the game has access to the k-zone except the guy calling balls and strikes behind the plate so there was one in particular where I think it led to a strike two, but it was kind of a pivotal pitch in a plate appearance. And it was a pitch that was moving downward and it was like maybe an inch and a half below the bottom of the strike zone. And Julian took it for what should have been a ball. Like he has a great eye and he took it for what should have been a ball. And the umpire rings it for a strike and it kind of swings the at bat. And Julian kind of like, oh, like rolls his head back and gives the, are you sure look to the umpire? It's like, well, Dude, like, you're going to have to sometimes just be a little more aggressive. And if the pitch is close and you know that that dude's had kind of a wide strike zone all day, you can't just bank on, yep, I got a great eye and that's a ball. It's still a human being that might ring you up or or swing a count for, that should have been 2-1 and one or 3-1 and one to something that's more pitcher friendly. So I think in general, like, it's awesome that he has a great eye, but he also should just be more aggressive and hunt for pitches to drive in situations like today. And probably the guy that's the absolute best at not showing up an umpire is Carlos Correa, right? I mean, he did that, I believe, in the Kansas City series where, all right, I know that is clearly a ball and it's what's called a strike against me, but how can I use that to my advantage? It's the same thing in the NBA, right, with like guys getting upset over referees, like, ah, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Um, but Correa has that patience, and it's patience about him where he's obviously played in so many playoff games and won a World Series where he knows how to do that. And obviously Correa's, you know, off to a great start. I'm sure you guys have talked about it too, but he's ripping the absolute cover off the ball. I think having that heartbeat, that's what I told Judd on opening day last week when we did our first pod of having Correa fully healthy, but also that mind and that person who has been in so many different situations as a big leaguer, having that guy is kind of like this breath of fresh air and this almost exhale sometimes with that lineup where they can lean on him. And at the end of the day, other guys have to execute for sure. But I think having Correa there for Julian's and the Kirloffs and the Walners of the world, I mean, it's going to pay off in a huge way for them if they tap into his potential. I think the thing too is, and Carlos, I'm, I'm guessing d does this as well. You know, a guy like Julian probably has to learn at times that pitch might not be a strike, but I'll just foul the ball off, right? Because like he's disciplined enough and he's good enough at, at the plate 
that you've got to know that if there is an outside chance that the call is not going to go your way at that point in time, it doesn't matter how well you technically know the strike zone. So there's probably pitches in the future, and I mean, he's still young, but you're probably going to have to learn, okay, until the electronic strike zone comes in, I'm just going to essentially accept the fact this might be called a strike and keep my bat alive. Now, that's, I'm not saying that's right as far as, yes, he's got you know, a great eye, but I am saying that you know, today there were opportunities probably to extend at bats, and that didn't take place. Yeah, like just like hunting for your pitch to drive rather than trying to be 100% correct on the pitches you're taking versus, hey, Dex, it, just going back to the pregame, um, Royce Lewis, you, I know you and, and Doogie had a chance to catch yeah. up with Royce Lewis. Give us an update on where he's at with this injury. Yeah, so he told Dugs and I that he did receive that PRP injection uh, the other day, and it is a grade two quad strain. He let that, I don't know if he let that slip, but uh, he did admit that it was a grade two quad strain, and that's something that on just the Google machine uh, is a moderate quad strain, so it's kind of in the middle there. Um, and he went to a Wolves game last night, because I saw he went to the Wolves game, so I asked, like, how did that go? Because he was actually, like, in the 200 level at the Wolves game last night. What? Yeah, he was We're in the 200 level, Royce. Dude, was dude, in, like, Justin the, Jefferson sits, I mean, TJ Hawkinson side. sits courtside, man. Like, yeah. we, we got to get Royce courtside. Uh, and then he said, and he had his wild jersey on the day, he said, actually, I'm probably going to go to the wild game tonight as well. So he's, like, on his feet, and he's moving around. And he even said, like, I'm sure the training staff probably doesn't love that I'm, you know, going to sports games and on my feet a lot and whatnot. But um, he was pretty <laughs> transparent with it, which actually I really appreciated. But yeah, he got the PRP injection. It's a grade two quad strain. And, I mean, outside of, you know, going to these local sports sports games and whatnot he did mention that he'll get a he had a meeting with the team doctor right after he was talking with us so he kind of got a probably a soft timetable of maybe what the next steps are for him but yeah it is a grade two quad strain is what he said to us and then that prp injection and he is also aloof with medical terms so when dukes and i and mostly dukes are trying to poke like what do you think that means and he's like honestly i hit baseballs like i i know nothing about what goes into the prp injection and the side effects and whatnot I'm, i am here to to hit baseballs and be a positive and optimistic person. So it was good to get an actual timetable from him. Um, but yeah, I, I would envision still like May 1st being the first real date before we probably know anything else before the next real timetable and, and staple of when he could come back to the, to the twins. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Dude, big J journalist Declan right now, now just now. absolutely slang it at target field. That's a great two, not one, but two. Well, but they, you know, but didn't Falvey say it's not mild, it's not moderate leading you to believe yeah, that it's yeah he said severe right severe but he didn't say severe didn't say severe oh i think he said something along but but by the way royce right. didn't say moderate royce said grade two and he declan googled two. and found moderate yeah. so yeah. i don't know yeah. is there a, maybe it's like a moderate to severe maybe it's like a He's, two and a half see in june <laughs> yeah unfortunately uh, that's what i would that say means. it's probably yeah. you've got to be careful you cannot screw this up yeah. like yeah, it sucks said, but you cannot rush us back he said he's a big, um, outside of like going to these sports games and a fantasy football fan and whatnot, he's a big YouTube guy, so he loves YouTube. So he is watching YouTube all the time on, on random random things, and he tries to stay off social media for it. So if you see him at the WoW game tonight, I don't know if he'll be in the 200 level or the club level so, for that, but keep an eye out for, for Royce Lewis. So he's basically me with athletic talent. <laughs> Just going to um, a bunch of games. Watch yes, watch when I when I think of Royce Lewis, I think Judd Zolgad yeah, with a little little bit more athletic ability. Yes, he's basically yeah. me with athletic ability. It's yeah. great. So, what a life! You yeah. know what? I'm not going to shoot down your dreams. Yes, you guys are the same, 100. <laughs> percent 54. I don't care. You can't shoot down my dreams. Not at this point. But good for him. Yeah. Uh, Dex, did you get a chance to apologize face to face to Alex Kirloff, or were you maybe going to wait till tomorrow? Or I guess they're not there Griffin. tomorrow, Saturday. Griffin Jacks was first. I was gonna say there's a pecking order of guys. I'm like, Emmanuel <laughs> Margot might be third after my rant yesterday too. Um, but no, actually, Alex, uh, I didn't see Kirloff during pregame warmups. I didn't see him during postgame stuff. Um, but but he is he looks great, man. I mean that that swing and that's exactly why you don't give up on guys and whatnot. I do like that even though he's DHing a good amount, which is probably good for him right now too to just kind of focus on hitting baseballs which is which is huge but him getting that triple the second one in as many days which is obviously clutch him and Correa have obviously been their two best hitters in this lineup and they probably you might you might need to probably put them next to each other even more at this point with Max Kepler probably struggling in that cleanup hole 
Mm. Yeah, dude, Kirloff, this is the hitter that, again, health is always a thing with him, but this is the hitter that everyone kind of envisioned like two or three years ago, climbing up from the minor leagues before that wrist injury. So like we said, though, even last year when he was kind of banged up with the shoulder, trying to figure out if the wrist was was good to go, and he still had an OPS plus of 117, so 17% above average. So he's if it's he's not going to hit 440, obviously, but like yeah. if it clicks for him, he is a well above average hitter, and he could be one of your top three or four hitters for for a season. So we'll see. Keep an eye on it. You, you guys want to do a random twin of the week here? Are we able I've to got do that it. from a from a broom closet and a Legends Club seat? Got, got my computer right here. So if you guys are prepared to take the clues, I have the clues. Came okay. up with them. I I forgot till the eighth. And then I had to scramble. And then I had to turn my computer towards myself so Declan, who was sitting right by me, could see actually. the computer. So, so anyway, yes, I have a random twin. Okay. okay. So All before right. before we get to your right. random twin here, let's uh, can we shout out Element Hotel? Are you in a position to yes. do that, Declan? Okay. Absolutely. Element Hotel in Minneapolis here, just literally steps. It's a stumble away down the steps here from Target Field. I don't recommend actually stumbling, but I do recommend stumbling into the door at Element Hotel. Uh, it's a great spot. It has a fitness center and it has an awesome rooftop, right? We got summer coming along here and you got to have some patio drinks and whatnot. They have Wi-Fi. They have parking. They have it all down at the Element Hotel. They're going to help us out, obviously, during the Purple Daily Draft draft party providing a room rate uh, so that's obviously awesome they're they're an awesome hotel they're a great spot here in the north loop so even if you're doing a staycation right from minnesota or wherever maybe you're an opposing fan coming to target field for the first time i recommend going to book your room stay at the element hotel here in minneapolis yes and if you are stumbling it's a safe place to stumble into because you can just get a, a room and it'll be great and you can you know avoid the riffraff so okay any other things from just like you're roaming around target field today dex before we get to Random twin of the week? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe so. I wrote down some other things about, yeah, about Royce Lewis, Edward Julian. We got to all of that. We got to Pablo Lopez. Uh, I would say my concern level on Matt Walner is still pretty high. I'm, yeah. I don't know if you two were able to talk about that while I was downstairs, but yeah, just, we touched uh, just some ugly, ugly abs. He took a, he took a hit by pitch today. That might have made things a little awkward. The so. panic meter. Do we, we should have like a demotion panic meter for various Twins players. What DEFCON? So DEFCON 1 is the worst, right? Correct. DEFCON. Five. What's the demotion DEFCON level right now? Five? He's entered five. So, well, five is like the state. Like that's, that's normal. Oh, five that's is nothing. calm. Five okay. is calm. Five is stable. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe three is Air Force ready to mobilize in 15 minutes. St. Paul ready to mobilize. Yeah, Sean we, Aronson ready uh, to mobilize. I'm going to three. The, yeah, I might need to get Sean or the green line operating here pretty shortly. One of the two. <laughs> I was gonna oh, okay. say it's an easy trip. I mean, it is. You could you could just <laughs> Uber. You could I mean you could you could take a scooter. I by the way, I saw the scooters being placed back around the Twin nice. Cities. Hop I a scooter. I wanted to take one today. I didn't see one. Dang it. Yeah. Good very exciting. Good to know. We'll get Judd on a scooter before the season's uh, over. No, 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 no. Sports no, no, dad on a idea. scooter. Hello. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Sports, sports dad wants to live. All right, are you guys ready? Let's yes. Okay. Random Let's twin of the week here for the audience. Maybe you're new. By the way, for those of you hanging out with us on the YouTube channel, thank you. We just launched the Scorner Twin Show YouTube channel about three or four weeks ago. You guys have us up to about 2,500 subscribers almost. So thank you for that. Click the like button and the subscribe button if you uh, enjoy our twins banter. Or if you just want to hate listen or hate watch, we welcome anyone here. And every Thursday, we do the random twin of the week on this show where... One of us throws out clues to the other two. And uh, to this point, Declan has 13 wins. I have 11. Judd has 10. Declan has two consecutive wins with Brett Boone and Trevor Plouffe. Before that, it was Kevin Tappany, Roy Smalley, Brian Busher, and Joe Creedy as the most recent random twins. We each get up. It's going to be Judd throwing out the clues. Declan and I can shout out guesses whenever we want to. Each of us gets up to three incorrect guesses, three strikes. Here we go. All right, clue number one. This random twin played for three big league teams in his career. He played for three teams, and that includes the Twins, just to be clear. Uh, clue number two. This random twin hails from Moses Lake, Washington. Oh, okay. I don't know if that's a suburb of Seattle, Phil, or it's close. Or... I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to hold that clue close to my vest. Moses Lake. Moses Lake, Washington is where he grew up. 
I also feel like you put this together so hastily in the eighth inning. I don't. I don't know. I was, there could be like a wrong clue in here. There could be no. There's some... not. No. There's okay. not. No. No wrong clues. I, I rechecked all my clues. Okay. Now it is a little bit hastily put together as far as the clues, but that's because it's abstract. I'm trying to mix it up. I'm trying not to be as predictable with my clue form, which leads okay. us to clue three. This random twin was taken in the second round of the 1999 draft. Second round pick in 1999. Okay. Okay. Nope. Keep going. I think I know who it is, though. Nope. Among the positions that he played in Minnesota, so just as a twin, played some first base, played some left field, played some right field, and he DH'd. Those were among the positions he played. First base, left field, what was the other ones? Right field, DH. Okay. DH quite a bit. DH quite a bit. Okay. Okay. Is it? Uh, oh, man. You said 1999, though, huh? 1999 draft. When would they make that trade? Uh, it would have been after that. Okay. All right. Well, it's not that guy. Yeah, it's not that guy. Okay. He made his big league debut against the Atlanta Braves. So his first ever game was against the Atlanta Braves. The Bravos. The Bravos. And the next clue, the that, Tomahawk Chopper. That team, the Bravos, would later become one of the teams he played for during his career. Okay. So he debuted against them and then later would play for them. And as I said, he played for three teams, including the Twins. <sighs> he, should, he should be living comfortably because in nine seasons, he earned $22.1 million. Twenty-two point one million dollars. Huh? Yep, yep. Nine seasons, so he's not like hey, I don't think he has three houses, but he should be comfortable. Okay, but that's like early two thousands too, man. Inflation. That's probably more like thirty some million. That's a good. That's a yeah, good. No, living. He, did, he did fine that's for good himself. Right there, he did yeah. fine for himself. I'm just saying. He, I'm sure he didn't buy any houses from Derek Jeter, but that's okay. By the way, um, I, I, yep. no looking at the comments either, because I know we're live. I have taken oh, yeah, the I comments don't. off I of the tab up. Okay, okay. I'm on my phone. I don't even know how to look at the comments. <laughs> and plus, I am leading the game. Uh, in <laughs> nine seasons, he had a career war, so for the entire time, of 8.9. Hmm. Nine seasons, 8.9. So, this so he was, was a, a replacement level player, player, basically. Almost. Well, He's a below well, average player. Above replacement level. Bravos, okay. twins. Bravos, twins. Bravos, twins. But a high draft pick, man. Second yeah, round is pretty, second pretty round good, man. Pick. Yep. Just to give you an idea on his age, just yesterday, he celebrated his 43rd birthday. Okay. So on Wednesday, he turned 43 years old. Okay. Okay. So he's probably like, so like debuting. So he's drafted out of high school. Hmm. You ready? Yes. All right. After playing two seasons as a twin, he was traded for the first and only time in his career. So he played for three teams. He was only traded once, and that was by the Twins. So he was either traded. Was he traded to the Braves, perhaps? Oh my gosh. That's what I mean, this is hardcore former twins right here. All right. Okay. That's a clue. Well, while I gave you the positions and said among the positions he played, I did withhold a very important one because you might remember him as a receiver. You might remember him as a catcher best. Chris Jimenez? Incorrect. No? Okay. It's good. It's a good one. But that was a good Catch, one. But he plays. That was a good one. Uh, okay. Oh. Is it my guy? Ryan Domit. Oh. That's it, Ryan Domit. Ryan, no, let's go. Ryan, let's go. Yeah. Oh. I'm dancing in the broom closet. <laughs> Dang it. Let's go, dude. 
forgot. He came up. Didn't he? He came up today. You actually, you whispered his name on the scoop, right? Who are we? We were talking. No, or was it? We were oh, talking about Trevor Plouffe and. <sighs> We oh, were yeah, talking said, to, we were talking about Pat about Plouffe and weird weird guys guys, guys who are mean to fill in the clubhouse and you mouthed Ryan Dolman. Dolman, yep, yeah, and Duke, he just kept talking. It was Pat. I think it was Pat. Pretty sure, but Pat okay. kept talking. And, and Pat Pirates, kept talking. <laughs> Pirates, Twins, Braves. Yep. Yeah, and yep. catcher Dang played it. some not the greatest receiving catcher. No, not a great. Receiving he was uh and yeah and he was justified to be mad at me one time when I was covering those Twins teams as a beat writer and. He dropped a pop-up as a catcher straight up the phone booth, man. Like, I think it would have ended the inning, too. And he gets under it. The ball falls. And the opposing team went on to put up a crooked number that essentially ended the game. And the beat riders are gathered. And I don't know. It was like my turn to ask the first question, I guess. You got hung out to dry. You got hung they, out to you dry know, they did. by your brethren. Lavelle. They- I'm going to name names. Lavelle was there hanging me out to dry. I think... I think maybe I think maybe John Shipley from the Pioneer Press. You got I love all these people. Because you knew or they knew he'd be pissed off, and so they let the young guy ask the question. But so he, he was, was he was sitting at his locker with his back and his his head yep. hanging because he knows he blew this game with a drop pop up, with yep. his back to the media assembled, and I tapped him on the shoulder oh, to like hey, tap. like you did the well, tap. we were ready, we were there. I tapped him on the shoulder, Ryan. Ryan, and he and he turns and What's he the turns. Kind of tapping? Like, we knew each other enough. Like, you know, I was like, hey, Ryan, he, like, are you ready for the media kind of a thing? And he turns halfway and he goes, what do you guys want? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, on that on that pop up. What happened? I think my question was something like, well, you know, on that pop up, can you just kind of take us through what happened? He goes, <laughs> he goes, what the F do you think happened? I dropped a pop up and I was like, that's that's, that's fair. A quote. That's a fair response. Yeah, yeah that's a quote. <laughs> that's Ryan a quote. Domen, last any other qu- any other questions? <laughs> and to his credit, well, first of all, yeah, it was whatever. Like, probably not the best way to ask the question. But he pulled me aside the next day and he goes, "Hey, man, sorry for flipping out there. I was just Pretty having nice. kind of a bad week." <laughs> like, he dude, it's wired, okay. Man, he was wired. He was really intense because <laughs> Pat and I had had him on Saturday morning sports talk after the twins signed him at the twins fest and he was like yeah. really cool and really laid back and so my and so i made the mistake of thinking oh man this guy's gonna be right i've made this mistake about so many guys and then they get in the heat of the season and they're just different oh yeah a hundred percent really weird it's like man at twins fest you were great and now you want to rip my head off <laughs> so all right there it is ryan domit i'm nice back work. on the board nice work all right, boys, we're going to get Judd out of this broom closet. You're going to see a lot more of Dex at the ballpark, these extra innings episodes. Any other final words of wisdom here from you guys from Target Field before we part ways? Just hit it, get a hit with runners in scoring position. That is, uh, it, it, it can't be that hard, right? Just go up there and get a base knock. What can you do here, for God's sakes? Get a, get a hit with runners in scoring position, please. Yeah. Please. Amen. 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position. Not quite going to cut it here. So, Dex, I can I can land this plane here on my end on the on the production side. So that's Dex at the ballpark. Judd in a broom closet at the ballpark. And we'll see you guys next time on the Scornar Twin Show.